Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another live stream here at Playground Sessions YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining me. I am coming to you guys today from the new studio and I hoped to have more cameras set up for you guys today, but alas, the move and the construction and the build out all takes time. It took a little longer than we wanted to, so we're still building it out. But I'm happy to at least be here bringing you my hands and my voice and my keyboard and a lesson today on how to determine the right fingering for a piece of music. Now, you guys voted on that topic in user voice, so I have made an, I've, uh, an oath, if you will, to provide you guys the topic that you voted on. But because we're now doing these once a month instead of once a week, I thought I would also bring you guys the second most voted on topic at the time of selection. And that was, as you guys wrote, salsa accompaniment. Now, Andrew had an idea to teach a lesson on queso, maybe some chips, maybe some guac. Uh, <laughs> that's a different kind of salsa accompaniment. Um, but uh, I definitely will be having some of that later tonight. But for today, in this lesson, uh, we can get into a lot of different territory when we talk about Latin music. And uh, most often people just lump it all into one category, not really realizing that there's a ton of variances and, and nuances. Um, you guys specifically asked for salsa, and what I want to say to that is let's ease into something that is a little bit more universally maybe recognized. Uh, and I guess I'm speaking just for us here on the West, but what I want to do is bring you guys something that's accessible uh, that uh, is also something that's really fun to jam on, and that is a Montuno riff. And I want to talk about uh, kind of the core elements of what goes into Montuno playing on the piano. And I think that there's some crossover there between the two topics. We're going to talk about some passages that could be awkward to play with correct fingering. And a Montuno is kind of one of those things. I was hinting at it at the beginning here. There's all sorts of different ways to do it, and I want to go over that with you guys today and talk about how to determine the right fingering for it. Before we jump into the lesson, I just want to say hey to you guys in the chat. What's going on? Mute Fish, that's a new name. I love it. What's up, Elta John? Hey, Robert Atkins. I missed you guys. Lynn Stewart, Meatloaf Crazy. What's up, guys? Hey, Pat, sir. I'm looking forward to this, too. It's been a minute. It's been a long time since we haven't done this weekly. Barbara Fazio, what's up? Roxy, Roxy's Boxing, that's a tongue twister. Hey, Jeanette Meats, you're almost through the intermediate advanced prelude in C. That's awesome. What a great piece. Um, I'm going to see if I can remember this on the fly. It's been a while, guys. Beautiful piece. Great work. Congratulations to you, Jeanette. Hey, Chris Carlson. Hey, Jeremy Shilley. Hey, Trevor Baines. Yes, you guys are talking about Grace being an earworm. I see. I'm moving through the chat backwards. I love it. So Barbara Fazio just completed Grace. Uh, so did Wayne McChesney. Trevor Baines, you guys, I'm so proud of your work there. That was a challenge, if I've ever heard one. What a beautiful piece, though, right? Let's see. is definitely an earworm in the best possible way. It sticks with you. Such a catchy song, and Shalea has a beautiful voice. For those who haven't checked that out, go to the interactive app. You gotta go to the, uh, it's actually in the song store now. You can download it with all the videos. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, it's not too late. I encourage everyone to dive in and practice becoming a better accompanist behind a beautiful voice, no less. So, you guys, we're gonna be talking about how to determine the right fingering for stuff. So there's a couple of things that I want you guys to keep in mind. First of all, if you're in Playground Sessions app, you are going to find finger numbers written above or below, depending on the staff, uh, all the notes that you see in notation. And that's because we like to give you guys all the tools that you need to be able to learn a piece of music uh, with ease, with as much ease as possible. 
Doesn't mean it's easy, right? It's still a commitment. But what we like to do is give you guys suggestions for the right fingers. Now, some other music books, publications, you'll see sometimes some finger numbers written and other notes don't have any finger numbers. Typically in those instances, maybe you've encountered them already, you'll see numbers written above, finger, above notes that are not obvious. Maybe it's difficult to uh, determine. It could be more than one finger, or maybe it's because you're changing hand positions. You're pivoting under or over. Those numbers will be written for you, but others won't. So for example, you might see a thumb on C and a pinky on G, but you're not going to see any numbers for these notes because it's implied that you're in that position. So what you're doing there, what you'd be seeing in that example, is showcasing the range of a phrase. You would see your thumb, and you would see your pinky, and in that hypothetical example, those are my outside notes of my range. Therefore, kind of telling you what the position should be, and the rest of the fingers are implied. So that's where I want to focus our first bit of this lesson today, is figuring out the range of a phrase. And so, let's take something like, in the Facebook group, I just went live a second ago, and we were looking at happy birthday for a second, so let's, let's look at that. Now, a phrase, in and of itself, is subjective. Is that a phrase, or is this a phrase? Right? You can have larger phrases or smaller sub-phrases. But really, you're looking for a complete sentence, if you will, of music. So, this is not a phrase. Right? It's not done yet. That could be a phrase. Or add this to it. That's maybe one phrase, maybe two smaller phrases. Either way, you want to start the sentence and stop the sentence. And you want to just look at that. What is the range of the notes? In other words, what's the lowest and the highest note within that phrase? So that seems pretty obvious here because the outside notes, again, are a five finger position, C and G. These fingers obviously fall on D, E, and F. So that's not much of a challenge. But when we move to the next E with our pinky, and then you have these notes in between. So here's our challenge for this. How do we play the middle notes with the least amount of strain or stress or stretching on our hand and fingers and wrist? That's the goal. That's the number one thing so far I want you guys to take away. When you're looking for the right fingering for a passage of notes that do not spell out the finger numbers above them, what you're looking for are the outside range of notes, and then you're looking for the middle notes to be played in a way that has the least amount of unnecessary tension. Sometimes you're going to have a stretch and you can't avoid it, but would you rather st stretch like this <laughs> or like this, for example, right? There's easier ways to do a stretch. So you're looking for the easiest way, the least amount of strain or stress, okay? So in this happy birthday example, There's a couple ways we can do this. Now, a popular school of thought is that if you can cover all your notes in a phrase with one hand position, that's the best way because you don't have to move out of that position. But I believe that in some instances, and this one included, that logic is a bit flawed because sometimes you can cover a stretch of notes with a tense hand when really the easier thing to do would be to play with a, be to play with a relaxed hand and then in a, in a relaxed way pivot over. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about here next. We have these as our outside notes and then we have A, F, E, and D. Now I could do it like that because then I have all my fingers already covering all the notes therefore I don't have to move my hand position. But look at how much I'm stretched here in these three fingers, the weaker fingers, by the way. I'm stretching from C to A and then from A to F. Now that is not comfortable to me and I doubt it's comfortable to anybody out there who's practicing along. Even though, technically, it allows you to play all those notes in one position. That's not the only thought here that we want to consider. So instead, what I would suggest is letting our hand fall in a relaxed way. Just let your hand and fingers go limp. You're going to find that your 
your, the range naturally falls between like a five or a six note position. So to me that means that feels comfortable. And then we just have one more note to get, and I believe it's very comfortable to just slide our hand over our thumb to reach one more note, maybe with our second finger. Now it's not necessarily comfortable for everyone, but I believe it's more comfortable than that alternative where we stretch 5-4-3. Instead, I think 5-4-2 is a much more relaxed way to go. Now let me pause there because many of you might be saying, well, I like 5-4-3 better, or I actually like 5-3-1 better, right? There's always going to be one, two, maybe even three alternatives to the suggested fingering that technically could work. And so that's why you might hear me or David Sides or Harry Connick Jr. or anyone else teaching you the piano, you might hear us say, fingering is more or less subjective, and that's why. Now, there's going to be a suggestion that we believe is right, because it's the, in general, the least amount of tension or strain to achieve, right? But everyone's hand is different, and some people have their own preferences. So I want to give you sort of the tools, uh, the, the checklist to go through as you find a piece of music that does not have the suggested numbers. What is your checklist? Well, first, figure out the range of notes for that phrase. Second, find a way to play the middle notes of the phrase with your fingers in a way that gives the least amount of stretch or strain, okay? And even if that means shifting or pivoting into a new position. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at the fourth phrase of this. This is something that someone brought up in the Facebook check-in here about an hour ago, and I wanted to tell you guys here as well. Uh, it was a great question, it was a great point, and it had to do with playing black keys uh, without bending your wrist in an awkward angle like this. We want to get used to shifting or sliding back towards the back of the keys and playing with that space as well. It's not just about horizontally stretching left to right or pivoting left to right. It's also about sliding to the back of the keyboard or forward to the front of the keys, depending on what we're playing. So here, it's a perfect example. At the end of this phrase, we reach up to a B flat. And to comfortably do that phrase, first, again, let's find our range, B flat to F. It's not a very wide range. But if we think about the height of our fingers, we need to take that into account when we're playing black to white keys. Obviously, there's no black key in the bottom half, right? So we have to reach up high to play the black keys. But if we keep our other fingers that are going to play white keys low, that is going to cause strain and tension. Think about it. If you're trying to reach this black key, but your other fingers are still way up here on the front of the keys, it's just going to be really hard. It's going to be awkward and tense. So how do we do this? How do we play the black key with our pinky, which is a shorter finger, right? It's the shortest of these four, actually. How do we play a black key with that pinky without bending in a weird way? Because our taller fingers are playing white keys. Well, I hope you've already seen it. I hope you already know the answer. We're going to slide back with those keys. Now, yes, that is going to mean that you're playing right in between two black keys, and that can be tricky, especially if your fingers are a bit wider or thicker, right? If you've got big hands, you may accidentally push down some of those black keys. But it's important that you come with a sort of a rolled finger and not flat fingers. If you're flat fingered, you are <laughs> definitely going to be playing the black keys on accident. But if you can curl your fingers, and just get the fingertips in there, it's going to help you a lot, all right? So once again, let's recap here this third and fourth phrase. First and second phrase were easy. It's all five finger position. Now, third phrase, we have an octave. And by the way, notice I'm not playing both, I'm not uh, hovering over both of these C's. I'm First, just playing the first C, then I'm stretching, and as I play my pinky, watch my thumb. I let go and I relax. There's no need for me to lock into this octave position. Like that. You can probably already tell when I do that, my thumb is extra tense. There's no reason for that. So, what we want to do is 
move and let go. Notice my hand contracts and, well, I guess it compresses and it relaxes. From here, I'm gonna four, two, one, and then bring my second finger over. And I'm gonna rest and go not only to the right, but back towards the back of the keys. So my pinky can play B flat. And to do that comfortably, the remaining notes played with my two, three, and four fingers, which are white keys, I'm gonna play them higher up on the white key. My goal here, you guys, is to more or less have a perpendicular angle. Uh, my hands and fingers kind of parallel to the keys, but perpendicular to the bottom of my keyboard, to this line. Uh, my wrist perpendicular to that line. If you start to feel like you're curving out like this, or you're bending this way to reach a note or a chord, that is a sign right there that you are using way more uh, energy and stress and strain than is needed. That's a big red flag and I want you guys to revisit your fingering if you find yourself doing that. So that is one example, that's happy birthday. And I just wanna recap here for you guys your checklist. First, you need to identify a phrase and typically a phrase is marked by, well, this is a generalization, but you'll often find a longer note at the end of a phrase, sometimes accompanied by a rest. Think about it like a written sentence. You put a period at the end of the sentence. <laughs> the last word gets an emphasis and then you pause. So you wanna look for that in musical phrases as well. A little pause there might indicate the end of a phrase. <clears throat> also, think about this. When you have a pause at the end of a phrase, that gives you more time to shift or adjust into a new position. So that's why we look at it at a phrase at a time. How do I play everything within one phrase? And if I need to change positions after that phrase, I might have a time to do that. So first, identify a phrase. Then, figure out the outer range. What's the lowest note and the highest note of that phrase? Then, figure out how to play the middle notes of that phrase in a way where you are as relaxed as can be, avoiding angles like this with your wrist and avoiding locked fingers, avoiding stress and strain, okay? Now, if you find yourself having to jump between black and white keys, which, of course, you'll find many times in your journey in learning the piano, especially if your thumb or pinky are playing a black key, then it's important to use this space and get comfortable with this motion, sliding to the back of the keyboard, curling up your other fingers, playing with your fingertips. And again, that's all to avoid weird bends and angles with your wrist. All right, who wants to earn a free song credit, you guys? I'm gonna check the chat here, and then we're gonna move into a little pop quiz mode, because it's been a while since I've given out some free song credits. For those who are new to the YouTube Lives, I like to give you guys opportunities to earn free song credits that can be redeemed in our interactive app. If you don't know about the app, you gotta check it out. It grades you as you play. Uh, and we're doing a free trial right now for YouTubers. If you click on the link in the description, I may ask Andrew to post it in the chat as well. Playgroundsessions.com slash YouTube dash free dash trial. 30 days to try the app with no strings attached. And if you like what you are experiencing, you can become a paid member. If not, again, no strings attached. You got 30 days to try. But we have a song store that we're constantly adding songs to, uh, all genres and we have rookie, intermediate, and advanced levels. We also do challenges. You may have seen people talking in the chat about the Grace Challenge, where we walk you through a song or an excerpt a day at a time with video lessons. Anyways, there's a ton in the app. I hope you'll check it out. And I like to offer little pop quiz moments so that people can earn free song credits to use in that song store. So here we go, guys. Pop quiz number one. What, let's see here. What is a good question for you guys? I like to ask questions that are related to the topics at hand, right? To make sure you guys are paying attention. And so, here's what I'll ask. What is the very first step when you are looking at a piece of music and you're trying to determine what's the right fingering here? We talked about a checklist of, of steps to take today. What's the very first step? And I'm just looking for the first correct answer, you guys. Let's see who's fast with this, and let's see who's paying attention. In the meantime, I'm gonna play a little bit here for you guys.
<laughs> All right, happy birthday to someone. <laughs> All right, I'm seeing some good, come, some good stuff come through here. Uh, and then I'm also seeing some questions that were in the chat. I'm going to get to right after we pick a winner here. I'm seeing some good stuff. I'm seeing people saying range. I'm seeing range. I'm seeing phrase identification, low note to high note, find a group, identify a phrase. Great job, you guys. Um, a lot of correct answers here. And I'm going to go ahead, I lied. I'm going to go ahead and give it to the top three uh, correct answers. The very, very first step here, you guys, I kind of threw you a curveball. We can't really talk about identifying the range before we first identify a phrase, right? So if you said range, you're not wrong. You got to figure out the range of notes within a phrase. So the first step is going to be identifying a phrase. And with that said, Chris Carlson has phrase ID. Now, I'm also going to give this to Wayne McChesney. Wayne says find a group. A group is another way of saying a phrase, I would say. A grouping of notes uh, that kind of has an, a natural flow, a natural grouping. So we, we'll give you that. And Greg Saber, you are our third winner for this pop quiz, identify a phrase. Great job, everyone. Now, finding the range of notes in the phrase is, of course, the very next step, the follow-up. So the correct winners one more time. Uh, let's see here. Chris Carlson, thank you, Andrew. Chris Carlson, uh, Wayne McChesney, and Greg Saber. Uh, if this is your first time winning, you guys, congratulations. Email support at playgroundsessions.com and say, hey, I want a free song credit, and Andrew is going to hook you guys up. He'll, uh, he'll add it right to your account, and it can be used, I think, immediately, as soon as it comes through. Sure. <laughs> Whenever you want. Doesn't expire. <clears throat> Okay, guys, great work. So let me go back and see if I missed any questions in here. Um, here's one from Jameson Gordon. Hey, Jameson. How do you know when to change your hand position versus doing a crossover under? Okay, awesome. So I touched on this a little bit in the happy birthday example, but I think we should go over that specific point one more time because it is a great question. Um, this one is where things get the most subjective, right? Because if your hand is half my size, well, you're not going to be able to comfortably reach as wide of a position. So think about it like this. If you need to stretch awkwardly to get a wide position, typically you're going to actually need to break that up into two and put a pivot in there. So if you can't reach this, uh, you know, something like this in one phrase, let's say your hand is twice my size, then that should be easy. It's doable for me, but I have an uncomfortable stretch between these three fingers, so I don't personally like that. If your hand's smaller than mine, you're likely going to feel really uncomfortable with that. So it's going to come down to uh, sort of gauging it with your own hand and your own feeling. But the general rule of thumb would be, uh, pun intended, would be that you want to try and, again, figure out what's your comfortable wide, wide range, and if the notes that you're supposed to play extend beyond that, then you're probably going to want to find a way to pivot with your thumb, typically. So what I would do here is... I might even do this. So again, get this out of your mind. Just because you need to quote-unquote change a position when you do a pivot does not mean that it's wrong. There's really a couple things at play here. One is Changing hand positions can be tricky if you are not used to reading notes on a staff and you need to rely on your finger numbers. For example, okay, C equals 5, A equals 3. If that's how you're playing music, it's not wrong if you're playing the right notes, but it's going to throw you off when you have to then switch into a different position. But when we're talking about this specific topic today, which is the correct fingering, it's not about reading notes. It's not about knowing the note names. It's about the physical feeling of your hand and fingers and making sure that you're doing something in a comfortable, uh, stress-free, tension-free way. And so I firmly believe that sometimes a nice relaxed pivot is more correct than a stretched out wide position. Also consider this. If you are stretched and strained and tense, it's harder to control dynamics and touch. I'm much more rigid when I'm tight and locked.
But if I can relax, even if I'm pivoting, I'm able to have much more control over my sound. So I'll leave it there. I'll say that, um, keep that in mind. You don't need to cover every note in the phrase with one hand position. And in fact, most of the time that might cause you to stretch further than you're comfortable. All right, here's a question from Elta John. What's up, Elta? Elta says, not sure if it's a fingering issue, but I notice when I move my hand too far, it makes the song sound too blocky. I wonder if that's touching on what I just spoke about, Elta, which is about having, if, when you're tense, it can feel kind of like uh, more rigid w when you're playing, right? As opposed to uh, something more fluid, which can be achieved with a relaxed hand. Maybe that's it, Elta. So this is more of a, of a comment than a question, but I think it's a good one. Elta, I think when, you're, when you, you move your hand too far, I'm thinking that you mean when you stretch it too wide, it makes the song sound blocky. Uh, if I'm misunderstanding you, Elta, just let me know. Um, Kathy Tosado says, is it a bad habit or wrong to look down at the keyboard when you change hand positions? Uh, Kathy, in general, I would say probably not. I mean, there's a couple of reasons why you don't want to look down at the keyboard. Uh, one is if you're reading music or reading, you know, the, the interactive sheet music in our, our, our Playground Sessions app. If you really need to look at that notation, then if you look at your hand, you're going to miss the notation. And often that can be a pianist's biggest struggle when they're re learning to read music is that they want to look at their hands. And then, of course, you lose your spot in the music, and then when your eyes jump back up, you have to search for that spot. That can be tricky. So if we're working on the specific skill of reading music, I would highly encourage you to try to look down at your hands as little as possible. However, if you are in one hand position and you're not moving, you don't really need to look down. But if you do have to move positions, especially a big jump, something like that, or whatever it is, something where you're doing a leap, uh, you definitely, unless you're like a wizard, you, you definitely are going to need to glance down. But it's important to know what you're glancing at. In other words, what I do is I try and, let's say I'm moving this chord. I'm not trying to identify all three of these notes with my eyes before I play them. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm moving this shape and I'm just looking for my top note. So I can identify that note quickly and I can move the rest of my chord shape accordingly. Now, if I'm reading music and doing that jump, then I'm just going to, as quickly as I possibly can, split second, boom, look for that high note, and then I'm already looking back at the music when I play that next chord. So it's a balancing act, Kathy, and I want to make sure that you don't end up with your eyes glued to the keyboard. However, if you're playing music that you've already memorized, or that if you're making something up, you're improvising, uh, what else are you going to look at, right? Of course, look at your hands. Uh, and. Uh, there's no right or wrong when it comes to that. Just identify your goal first. If your goal is to work on reading music, you want to spend most of your uh, time with your eyes on the, on the notes. Habib, Habib, what's up? Habib says, please put the dynamics on the score sheet of the songs. Habib, great point. Um, you know, when we talk about things like dynamics, like expression, um, you know, phrase markings even, uh, these are all things that you might find on a score to help let you know uh, maybe the way it's quote-unquote supposed to be played. Oh, this part's supposed to be really loud and then we get really quiet here, right? Uh, those are all valid things that we find in music and it's important to know what they mean. However, when we think about the core experience of the Playground Sessions app where we grade the correct notes and the correct rhythms, that's really what we want you guys to focus on in the app. From there, when you've got that stuff down, if you want to add some expression into your own performance, I highly recommend it. Um, but since the, the dynamic levels, crescendos, phrasing, things like that, are not factored into your grades in the app, we tend to not uh, clutter up the score with that stuff. The same goes for lyrics. Um, we've had people ask about putting lyrics in. We want to teach you guys the fundamentals, and the, the, the grading software uh, sticks to that. So thank you, Habib, I, and I think in the future, when we do more challenges, when we do YouTube lives like this, 
we can definitely talk about bringing music to life with those kinds of things. Hey, Rebecca Messier. Rebecca asks, is there a rule to specific fingerings, uh, fingers for the black keys? Now, Rebecca, um, I'm sure you're familiar with scales, major scales, as a warm-up uh, or as an exercise to build technique or just to get more familiar with a key. Um, now, scales have fingerings, yes, and especially ones that have black and white keys, you're definitely going to want to learn the correct fingering. That's because, especially as you move into more than one octave, let's see, a scale like A flat major, for example, it's just weird groupings of black and white keys. And there is sort of a, uh, a reason for the madness that you might find in some of those scales. Typically, it has to do with your thumb bridging the black keys together on a white key. So let's take a look at D flat major, for example. D flat major has all the black keys in it. Now we talked about the height of our fingers earlier, right? Take a look at where my fingers naturally fall on these three black keys, right in the middle. Now the height of my thumb puts that right in the middle of this white key. So it's really easy for me to roll through those four notes because of that. Now the next move I would do, let's go ahead and start with D flat. Two, three, thumb comes under to F, and then I'm going to roll through those. Now I'm going to roll through the next group, thumb comes under to C, same idea here. So in these scales you can find groups of three and four notes, and typically with black keys you're going to play with your taller fingers, and your thumb is going to be the bridge between the groups of black keys. And when you're playing through them, you can do that to see your groups. And then you want to just eliminate the pause in between. Okay? Uh, but when we're talking about a song, for example, or, or a melody, there's not really a blanket rule that applies to everything. It's going to have to do with, again, what is the phrase, the specific phrase that you're looking at. What black and white keys does that phrase contain? What are the outside range uh, of, those key, of, the, of that phrase? And then what are the notes in between? It's kind of like a puzzle, right? You've got to solve the specific puzzle of that specific phrase. But keep those kind of scale rules in mind. They have to do with the height of your fingers. And if you're playing something that kind of spans through a scale, you are typically going to use the scale fingering. That is written that way for a reason, right? So why would your finger height matter? It's because the more naturally your fingers can lay across a group of notes, the more comfortable and relaxed your hand and wrist and fingers are going to be when you play them. That's the name of the game for today's lesson. All right, guys. Well, what I'd like to do now is uh, I'm going to switch over and talk about this Montuno that I talked about in the beginning. I want to make sure that the internet is still going strong, everyone still connected, you guys still here and see me? Okay, cool. Um, so, let's talk about a Montuno, you guys. Montuno, um, <clears throat> we're not going to get into the history or the, the subtleties between different uh, types of, of these kinds of things. I just want to show you guys kind of the basic structure of a Montuno, in part because you guys voted on uh, well, you voted on salsa accompaniment, but I thought that this would be a little twist on that, just to give you a, like a little bite-sized kind of Latin piano riff. Uh, and also because it could be kind of awkward to uh, play with the right fingering. So I thought it would be good to talk about that today as well. So I'm going to play a little bit of a Montuno here for you guys. Okay, that's the idea there. Um, and I kind of added some complexity, but at its basic form, what you have here, and by the way, I'm just playing a C minor chord in the left hand. What we have is the root, the seven, the flat seven, and then the six. Just a chromatic walk down. All right, we can do something like that. Now, 
I will teach you kind of in steps moving up in difficulty until we're doing something like this. And then we can add what I was doing there, which was putting that in octaves. Again, when we're talking about the outer notes of our range, that's what we're talking about. It's all based on the same thing. So let's take a look first at the most basic, just we're going to look at whole notes, top line of notation here. We're starting with the root, and if you want you can add a left hand C minor chord, but we're just looking at the top four measures here. C, B natural, B flat, and A. Okay. Now if we look at the line of notation underneath that, we're going to start to see a little bit of a hint at that syncopated rhythm. Okay, and that looks like this. One and two and three and four. One and two and three and four. Now for those of you who are practicing along with me at home, why don't you try this with me? If you're feeling up to adding that C minor chord in the left hand, go for it. I'm just repeating the second line of notation here. You could also just do the right hand with me if you'd like. Now we have four notes right now, and so the range of this phrase is pretty tight. It's pretty narrow. It's right there. Now you may want to play it like this. It's not wrong, but I would say it's easier, at least for me, to do this. Now that is the core sort of melody of the Montuno, right? We have that chromatic motion. But what I like to do is ground that in a chord tone, and I like to use the fifth. And of course this is going to change our range of notes, but if we look now at the next line of notation, let's get the next two lines up, what we have is So I'm using this G to toggle back and forth with my chromatic notes. You still hear that line. You still hear this, right? But I'm adding some rhythm and a chord tone to anchor it when I have my thumb on G. Now how would we finger that? Well, we have C to G. And that is the wide range, right? That's it. Those are our outer notes. Now, I would not recommend, there are five notes here, right? I would not recommend trying to squeeze all five of our fingers into this position. Because we have four white keys and we have a black key in the middle. Yes, I can play that. But especially between three and two and three and four, it just feels a little bit crunchy in there, a little bit tight. And so, again, strain and stress on your hand does not only come from wide positions. If you squeeze too tight, you're going to get stress in there too. Remember what we said earlier, let your hand just naturally fall limp and see what that position looks like and see if you can accommodate the notes you're supposed to play with that relaxed, limp hand position. To me, that means actually double dutying with my second finger or third finger. Either way, whatever feels more comfortable to you. But again, this is that notion that if you have to do a slight pivot or a shift, that can still be more correct than squeezing your fingers all into the position. Okay, does that make sense? Um, now let's look at the final line. I'm just adding more G's in there. Okay, and I'm also uh, a little bit more syncopated with the end of the phrase. Fingering is not going to change there, okay? So I'm going to do... Again, for those playing along at home, if you want to add that C minor chord. Now, I didn't write this next part out, but I want you to think about it uh, with me here. It's going to be a bit trickier. I didn't want to write it out because it was going to look more scary than it really needed to be. But what I'm doing here now is bringing this thing up into octaves. So let's go back to... Uh, where before we were playing these G's, we'll just go to the chromatic line, but we're going to do it in octaves. Now 
Now, if you can't reach octaves, that's all right. You don't have to. But this is a nice way for me to visualize the shape here. What I'm going to do is now put that G anchor, that chord tone, I'm going to put it in the middle of the octaves. Now, when I do that, notice what's happening with that G in the middle. I start with my third finger on G, but when I then go to the B naturals, if I were to play that G with my third finger again, notice my hand starts to turn in this angle. So instead, I'm going to shift so my fourth finger plays G. Now I see that my hand is more perpendicular to the keys. Well, to the, to the edge of the keyboard, more parallel to the actual keys, right? So that's what I want you to practice there if you are able to play these octaves with me. Three on G, now four on G. Now check this out. As I move to the B flats, I'm going to again slide to the back of the keys. Still fourth finger on G, and then I'm sliding forward again to the A's. So I'm pivoting three on G, pivoting that to four. Then I'm sliding back while still holding that fourth finger on G, by the way. I'm literally sliding back on that finger. B flats, and then sliding forward again for A's. Now, if you want to really get fancy, you can add more chord tones in there. I like to add the E flat, because that is the minor third of the C minor chord. Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of variation on a Montuno. You can get even more syncopated rhythmically. Kind of making that up, but you could do all sorts of stuff and you skew the beat and get really weird with it. Um, there's all sorts of, uh, of directions we can go with that, but I want to keep it, I want to keep it there for today uh, on the Montuno. But, just a couple of examples there of how that could be awkward to finger. I hope you guys are tracking my logic for how I'm coming to the answers for the fingering that I'm coming to. So with that in mind, I want to go back in the chat. I'm going to see if you guys have questions about uh, Montuno or about general fingerings, uh, determination, stuff like that. Here's a question. Charles Smith is asking about C mixolydian. Uh, Charles is asking about a mode. And does this Montuno outline that mode? Um, Charles, this does not outline the C mixolydian mode. The C mixolydian, first of all, we're, we're talking about C minor here. And we also, what can be confusing is that we have that natural seven. Um, but mixolydian is the fifth mode. I'm looking to Andrew. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, which means that if we were, let's take it to C major, that's always a nice visualization. C, uh, the mixolydian mode within C would be starting from G to G, right? You're playing from the fifth scale degree, but you're using the key signature from, uh, from the, the key, right? The one, the C. So that ends up looking like this. It's like a major scale with a flat seven. Uh, so C mixolydian would look like this. So you're not, you're not far off, Charles, but don't forget, that has a major third in it, and we're working with C minor here. But you are right in noticing that it does have that natural six in there, and that flat seven. The natural seven is kind of a passing tone in there. Um, all right, so this is more like a minor uh, with a major seven. I think of it just straight up minor here. And the melody is just that. It's kind of a chromatic melody on top of that. Good question. All right, so um, where were we here? <clears throat> hey, Margot Kelly from Oregon. What up? Tony Holmes in the house. Roger Goo, what's up? Go. Catherine Sparks loves Grace as well. Yeah, that was a really fun one. I'm glad we got to look at Grace together. All right, where are we at here? I don't want to make sure I don't miss anything from you guys. 
Oh, cool. Jamie M's working on When the Party's Over by Billie Eilish. What a great song. <laughs> right. Oh, I love that progression. Uh, all right, all right. Let's see here. I look ahead to figure out which finger I need to move before attempting it. Yes, Jamie, you got the right idea. A lot of times, too, this is just practicing the muscle memory, too. You got to know where to go with your eyes, right, to, to hit the right chord. But then when you know that, you still have to have your hand practice jumping that distance and landing in that particular shape. Michelle, did anyone else learn to put a circle around the finger position if it's a pivot? Yeah, Michelle, that's a good point. That's another thing you might see. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you can write those in. Other times you'll see that written in notation. Um, sometimes what we do in the app is we tend to have a larger number. Sometimes it'll be red or blue instead of black. That tells you you're changing positions for that number. Uh, other times you'll see a circle around a number. Great point. All, these are all indicators that you're changing your position. All right, what else we got here? Oh, these are all earlier in the chat. Let me catch up. Hey, Jameson Gordon, I'm glad you're finding this helpful. Great. Kathy Tosato, I had to move up more than an octave in the song Habits, and I had to look quick because it was such a big jump, so I wasn't sure if I should just be able to find it without looking. Absolutely not. I mean, there is something to be said for kind of muscle memory of how far to jump. So in other words, if I'm jumping from this octave to this octave, I can pretty much guess, like, my hand's not going to go all the way up to here, right, if I'm not looking. It's also probably not just going to go to here. I know it's going to be around this area. So what I'm looking for with my eyes is just, where, was, where am I landing with my pinky? And if my hand can retain that octave shape, I'm pretty sure I'm going to find that C pretty quickly, too. And what you want to do is move quickly in the beginning. So, like, fly to the general area. And then when you're hovering around that general area, slow down and gently land. See that? All right, all right. Elta John says, Andrew, I'm looking at Fields of Gold Advanced. I love it, but you have challenged me with these four note chords in measures one through seven. All right, Elta, a challenge is a good thing. I an answer, but he answer. Okay, good. Andrew, Andrew uh, is a great arranger. I'm trying to, let's see, I know that song, but I don't have that arrangement uh, on top of my head. Do you want me to link it to you? Not sure if I can pull it up here. Oh, you can send me a PDF or a screenshot. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Charles Smith says, in my other course, it was explained that it's pretty common to look down for stride in ragtime. Yes, of course, Charles, and that style of music is particularly jumpy, right? You have... If you're not looking, you're going to sound like I just did, where you're just kind of slopping random notes. So you almost have to look down most of the time for that. Now there's tricks you can do where you can kind of shrink your stride position into, into a one octave position, like this. Right, where you don't have to literally jump two octaves. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, no doubt, that style of music requires a lot of jumps. Kathy Tosato has a good question. Are dynamics in the advanced boot camp? We do talk a bit, a bit more about expression and dynamics there, and so I'd encourage that. Again, it's not something that we're grading you on in the app with the interactivity, but it's a, a crucial part of playing piano, especially at the advanced level. Hey, Ella Rose, you got a piano teacher. I hope you're talking about me and playground sessions, but if not, that's all right. Hey, Joe Pan, more challenges, please. Yes, sir. We are going to be working up uh, one before you know it. Good question here, Jeremy Shilley. When's the next month's live lesson? We are going to be jumping in live again here on May 26th. That's the following, that's the, I believe it's the last Wednesday of May, right before Memorial Day. And... Uh, the topic is not picked yet because I'm going to look to user voice for you guys to vote on that topic. But there is a special treat that I want to bring to you guys, and that is to bring our friend David Sides into the mix. So I'm going to be looking to get him and doing a live interview with me on May 26th as part of our live lesson on YouTube. Now, I'm not guaranteeing that yet. i got to talk with David, but I promise to try 
And uh, we're also going to be teaching, uh, I'm going to be teaching you topics from User Voice as well. So make sure you guys go over to User Voice and cast your vote for the topic that you want to talk about next month. Let's see if Andrew sent me, sent me something here. <laughs> okay, cool. So, ah, the four note chord at the beginning here. Yes, 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 yes. All right, let's take a look at this. What key are we in here? Two sharps. Okay. Ah, nice. Nice, Andrew. <laughs> That's a nice one. I like that. Yeah, so what we have here is a great example. Now, some of you may not be able to reach this. This is wider than an octave. Yeah, Andrew, it's comfortable for Andrew. But there's a couple things at play here. We have a wide uh, stretch. We also have a black key in between our white key octaves. Well, not octave, but a white key outer range. So to play this comfortably, first, we're going to want to make sure that we can get our fourth finger up on C sharp comfortably. And to do that, we have to bring our second finger pretty high up on that A. Now, that creates kind of like a triangle. Thumb on D, second finger high up on A, pinky on E, and of course, fourth finger falls on the C sharp. To get that triangle feeling comfortable, you may want to rotate your wrist a little bit this way. Okay, thumb up, pinky down. Or rotating clockwise, maybe like a couple of degrees. Exactly, yeah, just like that. Now I know I've talked a lot about parallel to the keys and perpendicular to your, your edge here, but depending on the, the circumstance, you may tweak that a little bit. Here, if you wanted to be perfectly per, uh, perpendicular and have your fingers parallel, you'd have to get really high up here, and it just doesn't make much sense. Instead, if you turn a little bit, you can cover that much more comfortably. So I hope that helps. It's a nice little, nice little chord there. <laughs> I love harmony, guys. All right, I'm in the chat again here. I want to make sure I'm not missing you guys. Peaceful song. That's right, Elta. It is a peaceful song. master. <laughs> Margot Kelly is working on Intermediate River Flows in You. What a nice tune. Let's see. Is that in, uh, I think that's in. A, right? There, something like that, and that's another. I remember a challenging one when it comes to right hand fingerings because it's something like, something like, there's like a melody and a little counter harmony part in the right hand. Good for you. That's a, that's a really beautiful song. It's really set up the test of time, too, for a while now. I remember being in my young 20s teaching kids how to play that song. And I'm just not going to say how old I am now, but uh, <laughs> I like this. Wayne McChesney says he puts a, a CPC, uh, a change position coming, a few notes before the change comes to be ready for the change. Hey, whatever works. Andrew and I had the same teacher growing up, although we were in school at different times. Uh, Jack Shantz would, would write a little, he would literally draw a pair of glasses <laughs> in the score, uh, which was a reminder to like, look, like, don't, don't miss that. Look at that. 
Here's a question from Chris Carlson. Could shorter hands do low E and high D? Let's see. Low E, high D. Are you, oh, he may be talking about the voicing on uh, Fields of Gold. Uh, you'd think that, you know, logically that you could do that because you can invert stuff and it's all kind of the same harmony. But you would end up getting into a weird, you would lose the melody here and the voicing wouldn't sound quite as good. So here's the octave Bs. Here's that Fields of Gold. What's important about this voicing is you have this A major triad on top and you have this space between these two. If you were to invert that, it's not going to be a wrong chord, but it's just going to kind of be a, a different texture. You're going to have... Um, I don't mind that, but I think it just depends on the context. Andrew, Andrew does not... Uh, he does mind it, and he arranged it, so he, he gets the final say there. But he doesn't know what you're doing at home if you're practicing it that way. It'll be our little secret. But I love how spread out this voicing is. You get the clear A major harmony, you get this nice fifth here. Here, you lose a little bit of that clarity, in my opinion, and Andrew's. <laughs> I'm just looking through here for a final question or two. How do you handle chord progression more than the normal chord progression? How do a chord progression that's more than the normal chord progression? Adoja, if I'm not sure I'm following there. I want to answer your question, so let me know if you can elaborate on that. All right, Sarah, here's one from Sarah Pickles. How do you play an emotional piece without crying? <laughs> hey, uh, I'm not crying, you're crying. Uh, or how do you play through the tears? Love it, Working on Heaven Can Wait by Meatloaf. <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think that River Flows In You song is really like a tearjerker, in part because of the chord progression. Andrew's already crying. Yeah, I mean, what you, the more expressive and flowy you can be with that kind of music, the more it feels like it wants to be a tearjerker. Um, I think maybe just like anything else, it takes practice, you know? Practice through the tears. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love the emotion that you have when you're playing. Elta says, what is the voicing on that chord for Fields of Gold? Is D one voice and the other three notes are the other voice? You could think about it like that. You know, when you have an arrangement for the piano, technically it's all, you know, it's all, it's all just your hands, right? And so you, you could group them in different ways, but if you were gonna arrange this for an ensemble, you know, uh, you could definitely think about, uh, like, up here maybe is one group of instruments Trumpets, yeah, get the high brass up there. Down here, you got the trombones playing the octaves. And then what do you got here on the D, Andrew? First trombone. First trombone, okay, yeah. Yeah, or, you know, if you wanted to build it out more, you could put like saxes on Ds, you know, something like that. Yeah, that's more of an arranging choice, and I think it's a good, it's a good thought. Like, what are the different voices? But yeah, I think, again, that just goes to that notion that when you can separate these parts, you got the roots, you got that minor third holding down in the middle, and then you have these extensions up top that form a nice major triad on their own. It's just a really clear way to voice it. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get into another pop quiz. I want to teach you, I want to give you guys one more opportunity to learn, uh, excuse me, one more opportunity to earn a free song credit. Because the interactive app is pretty cool, you guys, if I do say so myself. And uh, we're putting new songs in there all the time. You guys have the opportunity to get these songs for free if you're paying attention here in these YouTube Lives. So, let's talk about Montuno. And I'm looking for the first three correct answers here. <clears throat> what is the word that we would use to describe the movement of that melody, of that, of that leading tone, uh, not leading tone, of that motion that we have up here in the right hand. How would we describe that? I talked about it a little bit already. You can see it, you can hear it. What kind of
kind of a movement is that called? First three correct answers. I'm seeing some stuff come through already, so I am going to play for another 30 seconds or so, give you guys a chance to write. This one's for Elta, or was it Sarah that was talking about crying? Sarah, Sarah Pickles. This is the uh, emotional Montino for you. What is this kind of motion called? All right, good. I'm looking for the first three correct answers here. Let's see here. All right, I'm seeing chromatic, chromatic, syncopation. I'm seeing some descriptions of those notes. I'm seeing, okay, guys, so the correct answer here that I was looking for was chromatic. Yes, indeed. Chromatic means half-step motion, okay? Going down by half-steps or up by half-steps. And that is definitely what defines this kind of Montuno thing. It's moving around like that by half-steps. It doesn't have the same effect if you go through diatonically or in the scale. I mean, I guess it kind of does because you have the rhythmic element, but that really catchy, hooky part of it, to me, is that half-step motion, which is chromatic. So, first three correct answers here. Robert Atkins, my man, chromatic. Mutefish in the house, hey! Mutefish says chromatic, that's correct. And Jeremy Shilley said chromatic as well. Now, were any of those three winners on the first pop quiz? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Um, <laughs> Robert is one of our of our gold uh, our gold winners here most of the time. Elta John, I'm going to go ahead and give you. Uh, let's see, one root seven flat seven. Elta, if you added the six in there, then you'd be fully correct. You got root seven flat seven, and then you put a. That's correct in this key, but if you said natural six, I would give you a bonus credit. Okay. Yeah, these are all the okay, got it. I see. Thank you. Cool. Now, Elta, you said octaves. That I can see why that's confusing because I was playing them as octaves. But the motion, the movement from one note to the next is still chromatic. So chromatic, that chromaticism is an important part of this kind of Montuno riff. Charles Smith would cry if he couldn't find his donuts. Yeah, that's, that sounds really sad. <laughs> Sarah says, Charles, you lost your donuts again? You guys crack me up. <laughs> awesome, Kathy. I'm glad you're learning new terms and you are enjoying it. So this was fun, you guys. I just want to do a quick recap here. When we're looking for the right fingering, we've got to figure out the phrase at a time. We look at a phrase, we figure out the outside range, the notes, the outside 
widest notes of that position. That's typically, uh, it, well, depending on how wide it is, it's likely going to be your thumb and pinky, right? But if it's wide enough that you've got to stretch your hand too far, then you want to break it up into two, and you can do that by using a pivot or some sort of a shift. Now, if you've got a black key and a white key mixed up in a phrase, you are definitely going to want to utilize this motion, that front to back motion, because the height of your fingers are all different. And you don't want to have to bend in a weird way with your wrist to accommodate a mix of black and white keys. Instead, if you're playing a black key with your shorter fingers, slide to the back. And if you need to curl your longer fingers, that's the right way to do it. Keep relaxed, keep stress free with your hands, and typically I will say that you're probably doing it with the correct fingering. Great work, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to leave it there, you guys, but I want to remind you one more time, our next YouTube Live is going to be Wednesday, May 26th, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Let me know if this time works better. I know it's almost the same time we used to do, but it's a little earlier in the day. Uh, and we're going to continue to do these uh, based on what's voted on in user voice, so thank you guys for voting. In the meantime, I'm going to be doing some casual check-ins, quick little 10-15 minute little pop-ins on the Facebook group and just kind of checking in with questions you guys might have throughout the week. So if you miss me and you want to come back to the weeklies, consider joining the Facebook group for those quick check-ins. Otherwise, I will see you guys in about a month for the next YouTube Live, May 26th, 5 p.m. Eastern. Thanks so much for hanging out with me, you guys. I hope you found this lesson to be helpful and I will see you guys next time.